you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Romans. I want to welcome all of our guests here today. Why don't we give them a round of applause? So good to have you with us today, worshiping. Amen. If you, if this is your, if you're a guest here today, you are hopping in the the middle of a, a series um, in the book of Romans that I, I've just. I've just given up and said, all right, God, <laughs> this is yours. And, uh, and God has certainly been giving me a, a depth and an understanding. And I am trying my hardest to convey that, preach that, share that, because there is such a richness. Look, we can serve God. You can come to a you can come to a goofy gums service. Watch, watch brother gums jump around and act all goofy. You can receive the Holy Ghost. You can be baptized in Jesus' name. You can you can be ready to meet Jesus. Amen. If the rapture would come that afternoon, you'd be ready to meet him. Somebody were to come to this service, never, never hearing a word of God, they could come and experience that. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. But as you serve God an amount of time, I'm thankful for the richness of his word. I'm thankful for the, the depth of his spirit. I'm thankful for that. And so I enjoy going through this. I hope you do too. We're going to be going through Romans chapter 6 today. Last week we talked about God's purpose for tribulation in our life in Romans chapter 5. But before we begin, why don't we just lift up our hands and can we just invite the Holy Ghost to have liberty in the rest of the service this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. We come in with praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. My God, we need you right now. We ask, Lord, that your spirit would minister to every single heart. Change us, Jesus. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Amen. We often just kind of make that our prayer, don't we? Isn't that what kind of... Preachers get up here and say, you know what, change us. And Again, nobody really likes change, or very few people, I should say. Statistics say that there are, there's, a sm- there's a sliver of the population that actually likes change. But most people do not. And so when the preacher gets up and prays, change me, there's kind of like, ooh, <laughs> I'm just fine. Preacher, leave me alone. But really, really, when we come into the presence of a mighty God, when we come in contact with a mighty God, I don't see how we can leave the same. I don't don't read of people in the Bible that come in contact with God and just say, well, that was nice. Thank you for that. Uh, Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for the touch. No, there's a change. There's there's something that happens. uh, All of us would love to have that that relationship with God where we could just talk with him every day and he would talk back to us. and, And maybe some people do. I don't. Sometimes I pray. Often I pray and I get done praying. And I just start my day. Amen? Anybody honest? <laughs> and I would love to just say yes, and the Lord spoke to me and said, sometimes, I don't know, I just read his word, take that into my heart. And I was praying about that. I was saying, Lord, I just want to have that, that conversation with you. And something struck me, just something struck me. And that he is such a holy God. And that we don't approach him lightly. Amen. 
And, and when he's silent, and he is often silent, it's for a reason. It's for a reason. And when he speaks, and he often speaks, he's intentional. There's purpose. And so I said, all right, God, you're God and I'm not. I thank you for every time I've felt the moving of your spirit. I thank you for every time I've, I've heard your voice. And Lord, I thank you for the times that I haven't heard it. I thank you for the dry times. I thank you for the times, Lord, when I pray and it doesn't seem like anything happens. But I'm thankful for the word. You can always go to the word. Amen. In the last five chapters that we've studied in Romans, there's been just this, this theme that, that, that I just have felt to, to just keep preaching of faith. And, and, and we know about faith. We've heard about faith. We, we, have a, we have an understanding of faith. But Paul talks about the difference between faith and works. And I feel Calvary that we as a church and, and maybe us as a movement, sometimes we, we put more faith in our works than we do in our God. And that we do something and then we expect something to happen because we did it. And we will never admit that we put faith in our works. We always say that we put our faith in God, but... I think it's just a, a small adjustment and just a, a small revelation that if we can understand that, you know what, we have to have complete faith in God. We, we believe that God is going to heal, so we pray. We know that and know and believe that God is going to heal. That's why we come to the altar. So often we, we do something and then, then put faith in what we do and then get disappointed when it doesn't happen. You come to the altar, and, and you said, because I come to the altar, God's going to heal me. No, God's going to heal you. That's why you come to the altar. And so we have to make sure that we are not putting more faith into our works. But I want to move on into chapter 6. And chapter 6 starts off with this question. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, and he answers it in verse 2. and says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And so now we move to, a, to another topic that I, I believe, uh, this is entitled the Roman Revival. We move to another topic that I believe among Christians is misunderstood, and that is the topic of grace. Many people have been taught and believe that grace is this kind of, um, the, 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 you remember play Monopoly and you get the get out of jail free card. And so that, you know, when you land on a space to send you to jail, you can just pull out the get out of jail free card. And boom, I'm just, I'm out of jail. And, and I feel like some people look at grace that way, the, like a grace card. That you know what, I can make a mistake. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll play the grace card. God, you know that I'm a sinner, and, and so I just plead your grace, and, and everything's okay. We just have this understanding, or if I can say a misunderstanding, of what grace really is. Most define grace as unmerited favor. I agree, but I would also say that this is incomplete. All right, for, for somebody just coming in that has no understanding and, and they ask, what is grace? I'm just beginning to read my Bible. I don't, I don't think that that's a bad place to start. It's, it's unmerited favor. It's, it's God doing something and we don't deserve it. It isn't based off of work. So, so it's a good, and if I could say this, it's an elementary definition. It's a grade school definition. How many don't want to stay in grade school? There's more to grace than just unmerited favor. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10 says this, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, Paul says. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. And then he says this, But I, what? I labored more abundantly than they all. 
What are you talking about, Paul? We're, we're not supposed to be talking about work and laboring. It's just, it's just grace. But Paul says, yet not I. It wasn't I that labored, but the grace of God which was with me. Uh, John Piper has a, has a description of grace. I want to read this. It appears that the word grace in Paul's verse not only refers to God's character or his disposition or inclination to treat people better than we deserve. That's that undeserved favor. But the word grace also refers to the action. Turn to your neighbor and say action. Action or the power or the influence or the force of this disposition. Yes, he, he gives us unmerited favor, but it doesn't stop there. Grace isn't just that one-time card that you play when, you're, when you messed up terribly, when, 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 when you just, you, it isn't like a reset button, you know, where, where things got really bad, and so you just hit reset, and let's wipe out all the old, and let's just start over. I think of the old Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> There's no youth in here. They would be like, what? Remember the old Etch-a-Sketch? You know, you'd turn the little knobs and one would go up and one would go across and, and you'd do that and you'd make your drawing and you'd have it really good and then right before you go show mom or dad, your brother and sister would take it and go, Ch -ch 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 -ch. or if you didn't like it, you could just take it and just, just shake it. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> I think some people are like, that's how I want my life to live. I make all these mistakes, and then it's like, grace. Grace. Say, there we go. And now I can start all over and keep making mistakes. That, that's a misunderstanding of grace. That's a cheapening of God's grace. I believe that frustrates God. But, but this definition goes on to say that it's, it's, the, it's this power which, which produces real, practical outcomes in people's lives. Like being, like, like being sufficient for good deeds, or enduring the thorn in the flesh, or working harder than anybody else, as Paul says about his own work. How was Paul able to, how was Paul able to say, I labored more than anybody else? Was it because of his training? Was it because of his upbringing? Was it because of his... Physical stamina? No, it was because of the grace of God. How was Paul able to endure this thorn in the side that he just couldn't seem to kick? Paul was used in the miraculous. He, he, he did amazing things, but then he said, God, I got the devil just, just beating me up. He's buffeting me. What did God say to him? My grace is sufficient. You can endure this. No, I can't do You can endure this. No, I can't. You can endure this, not on your own, but by my grace. So that's how Paul was able to say, I've labored by the grace of God. That's how we can live this life. Not on our own. Not on our own physical, I'm just going to power through this. I'm going to pray through this. I'm going to fast through this. I, I, I know. By the grace of God that you're going to make it through this. It's by the grace of God that we're going to make heaven. It's by the grace of God that we're going to reach this city. Are we going to have to labor? Yes, we are, but it's not going to be on our own strength. It's not going to be uh, off of anything that we've done. It's going to be by the grace of God. So is grace a free gift? Or does a free gift come by grace? In other words, does God give the free gift to everyone? No. It's available to everyone. God's grace is available to everyone. If right now the entire, oh, the whole world would hit their knees and recognize Jesus as Lord and would repent, God's grace is available to the, to the billions of people around the world. But does everyone receive grace? No. How does it come? It comes to those who have faith. 
That's the, that's, what, that's the foundation that Paul has laid in the first five chapters. So it's available. It, it, it is unmerited. We, we can't earn it, but, it, but it, 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 not everyone receives it because not everyone has faith. So that grace comes by faith. He goes on in verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we had been planted together, this word literally means united, to, to, to plant two things together and they, 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 they spring up together or grown together. If we are, we are planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness in his resurrection, of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Wow. Does anybody just read those verses and, and, and see the, the entire gospel message? How, how can people not say that? Oh, it's there. We're baptized. How are we baptized? Into Jesus Christ. He didn't say titles. He didn't say father. He said we are baptized into the name. And we are baptized into his death. We're buried with him. That's how I explain to people that are looking to get baptized. Look, this is going to be like a, like a burial. I'm going to put you underneath the water. That's why we don't sprinkle. You don't bury someone just by sprinkling some dirt on them. You, you put them down into the ground. That's how we are baptized. We are buried, the Bible says. But it doesn't stop there. Because what? We are raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we should walk in the newness of life. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed. This new birth, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking of other tongues is just the beginning. In repentance, when, and when you come and repent, wherever that is, when you repent of your sin, when you say, God, I'm sorry, I can't do it myself, the old man, the old Patrick, the old whoever is being crucified. You are killing, you're literally killing the old man. When you say, I I'm sorry, God, I've disappointed you. I can't do this on my own. That is repentance. That is crucifying your old nature. You can't, everybody needs to repent. John the Baptist preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. Peter preached repentance. Paul preached repentance. It is, it is the very first step. When you are baptized, what happens? That old man, that old man that was crucified, what happens? What happens in baptism? He's buried. Because dead things need to be buried. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when you speak in other tongues for the very first time, that is, that is the, the raising up of a new man. Why? Because if you just crucify a man and bury a man, that's kind of hopeless. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you there. You need to be born again. And so in spirit baptism, the new man is born. So when you come out of the baptismal tank speaking in tongues, that is the beginning. That is the very first, you, you have been born again. And now you are able to live a victorious life. You cannot live a victorious life without repenting, being baptized, and receiving the Holy Ghost. You can try you can work at it. You can, you know, take all sorts of programs and counseling and read books. You can try. And some people have. You know what? I've, I've seen people be pretty good. I've seen people make some pretty good changes. But over time, over time, there's always a fracture. There's always, there's always a, a, a crack in the armor where something comes true. And no matter how hard they tried to live right, 
no matter how hard they tried to kick old habits and be a good husband and be a good wife, no matter how hard, there's always something that kind of breaks through. Why? Because you cannot do it yourself. We need the grace of God. And we receive that grace, the, the, the very beginning, we receive that grace by being born again. And we see it in the, in the book of Romans. And he goes on to say, now if we be dead with Christ, in verse 8 of Romans 6, we believe we shall also live with him. I'm thankful for the hope of this message. I'm thankful that Paul doesn't just leave us dead. He doesn't just leave us at, a, at an altar of repentance and say, well, there you go. Now you just have to somehow make it till Jesus comes back. No, he doesn't leave us there. He says, you're going to walk. We're going we're to live with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, he dieth no more. Death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, church. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and you can't receive the new birth unless you first believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then you can believe that you receive the same promise that we are also raised from the dead. Physically, not yet, but spiritually. Spiritually, just like, just like Jesus physically died, was physically buried, and physically rose, we spiritually need to die, spiritually have our old man buried, and spiritually receive new life. And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of our walk with him. And from there, it says that, that we are, we're, we're dead to sin, but we're alive through Jesus Christ. Once you're baptized in Jesus' name, you don't need to be baptized again. The old man is dead and buried. We don't believe in zombies. All right? We don't believe in the, in the walking dead. We don't believe that the dead come back to life. No. When you are baptized, no matter, you know, oh, I was baptized at six years old. I didn't really have a good understanding. You know, I was baptized at 30 years old, and I didn't have a good understanding. I wish I could go back and have a better understanding and have a, you know, appreciate it more. We, I, I think we all, we all do. Why? Because when we were baptized, we were babes. We were babes. We, we, we had the initial understanding. We had faith to believe that our sins were washed away, but no, we've, We've grown in that. So many of us have come out. Oh, I wish I could get baptized again. And, yeah, but you know what? That baptism counted. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I know you didn't know that. Well, I, I, I messed up. I know you did. But you had faith at that baptism. It was maybe just a mustard seed. It was maybe just a little bit, but it was enough. It was enough for God to say, I will recognize that as a, as a child in the Lord, and your sins are washed away. And when the old man is buried, he does not come back. So the Bible says that Christ being raised from the dead, he, he dieth no more. So when we're baptized, we don't, we don't need to be baptized again. If you make a mistake, as we all do, you just say, Father, forgive me. And the Bible says that he is faithful to forgive. But like I said before, baptism isn't enough. You need the Spirit of God living inside you. It's not enough to, be, to, to crucify your flesh and bury it. It's not enough. You've, we, we've got to be raised from the dead. See, that's where many people, that's where many Christians are living. I, I, I would love to just know how many, how many Christians have repented. I believe, I believe it's a majority. I believe there's, there's many Christians, most Christians, I believe, that have repented. I believe many people have found that place, that altar of repentance. I believe it. And I know a lot of people have been baptized. I believe a lot of people have been baptized in Jesus' name by immersion, the way the Bible tells us. But we know when statistics tell us not many have received the Holy Ghost. So there are many people that, are, that have that old man 
crucified and buried, but they're struggling with the life. They're struggling with how to live this life. They've, they've done what they've been taught. They've, they've done what they know, but they're, they're, having, they're having trouble living in that new life. And could I even say, among the apostolic church. Why? Because we're not walking in the newness. Because we somehow felt that, that grace was just for my salvation, but after God saved me, I guess I have to figure this out on my own. No, no, brothers and sisters. That grace that saved you, that grace that washed away your sin, that grace that, that, that poured out the Holy Ghost in your life, that grace is still available to live a victorious life. Something to remember and consider. That old man, you know, before you crucified him and buried him, he taught your flesh some things. Amen, you can pinch yourself if you want. Go ahead and pinch yourself. Are you still flesh? Are there any, are there any angels among us? I believe it. <laughs> are there any just celestial you know, bodies in here. No, we're all, you know, we're all flesh. We're all flesh. So you know what that old man did before you crucified him and buried him? He taught your flesh some things. And, and, and you know what? Even though you buried that old man, you still have a sinful nature that we received from Adam. Again, I'm, I'm referencing back to a previous lesson. We all have that sinful nature. So we, we, we are baptized, we receive the Holy Ghost, and we're all excited, let's do this. And then we leave church, or maybe on our way to church. That old man, that old sinful nature, that flesh, which we still have, that flesh remembers some things that our sinful nature taught it, and we get mad. And we maybe say something we shouldn't have. Maybe we do something we shouldn't have. And what does the devil do? What does the devil do? But You know what? I don't think that repentance was, I don't think it was 100%. I don't know if you really repented. Now, really, did God wash away all your sins? The Bible says that he forgets, but the devil don't forget. You don't forget. So what does the devil try doing? Tries whispering in your ear. You're not really forgiven. Really, did you receive the Holy Ghost at junior camp, family camp, uh, that, that service? I think it was just, I think it was just all the excitement. I think it was just the emotion. And the, and the devil begins to speak that into your mind. Why? Because we make a mistake. Why? Because we don't have an understanding of why we made a mistake. You didn't make a mistake because the old man rose from the dead and somehow kicked the Holy Ghost out of you. It's not why you made a mistake. You have a mistake. You made a mistake because we still have a sinful nature, because we still have flesh. But we don't, we don't serve sin anymore. See, that's the difference. Before you were baptized, before the Holy Ghost... You were a slave to sin. I'm getting ahead of myself, but, but that's the difference is, is you couldn't shake it. You couldn't beat it. No matter how hard you tried, you could not overcome that addiction. But now you have the power. Now you are able, how? By the grace of God. And, and, and not just should, you, you, we shall. We are supposed to. Live a victorious life. Flawless? No. But no longer a slave to sin. No longer are we just driven. No longer are we helpless against sin. That is the major difference. Amen. I, I look back at before I, before I repented, before I was baptized, before God filled me with the Holy Ghost, there were things I, I wanted to change. There were addictions. There were strongholds I wanted to get rid of. I knew they were wrong. It was hurting my family. It was hurting me. But I just couldn't. I would try. I would, I would do all sorts of things, but I just couldn't. After the Holy Ghost, things changed. I didn't have an understanding of why. I just know they did. 
I just know that that, that habit that I couldn't kick for about 15 years after one three-day fast, God took it away. By, because I fasted? No, because I had faith. Because I believed, and by the grace of God, he took it away. And I don't believe that there's any stronghold. I don't believe that there's any sin. That by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Ghost, he will not help you overcome. Can somebody just thank God? Can somebody just clap our hands unto the Lord? Come on, could we thank him for his grace? Hallelujah. After our new birth, our sinful nature isn't, it's buried. The the old man is buried, but we still have the sinful nature. We still have the capability to sin. I think that's what confuses some people. Oh, but I was baptized, but I received the Holy Ghost, but I repented. How come I still make mistakes? God didn't take away the, the capacity or the capability to sin. We just don't serve it any longer. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. He said, don't let it reign. Don't don't let it rule. Sin should no longer rule in your body. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. Because that's what we did as as an old man, as the old person. Neither yield. This yield is a Greek word, paristeme. It, 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 It literally means, and I think... Someone said it, or we sang about yielding, or this yielding means to place at one's disposal, or to stand beside, or to stand near, or to be in fellowship with. See, sometimes I think we, oh, I have to yield to you, Jesus, so we, we, we somehow think that we have to, uh, you know, wait at that yield sign and Just let God go through, right? That's what I think. I think when I read about yield, I think of the yield sign. I'm like, I need to yield. I need to let God drive through and and get my, you know, I want to go. I'm in a hurry, but, you know, I got to yield. When really yield is more about just just being, just standing near, just being in the the presence of God, just being in fellowship with him. It's not so much a, a just a... It's not so much an action as it is just a, just a way of living. Just a, just a constant state of, of yielding to God. Just being in that place nearby to God so that when he says now, we're available. We hear it and we obey it. He says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness on the shield, but yield yourself unto God. Be in the presence of God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Verse 15 says, what then shall we sin Because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. Verse 16 says this, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. So can we sin after we're saved? Absolutely. Can we serve sin after we're saved? Yep. God has still given us that capability. Just because someone received the Holy Ghost doesn't make him an angel. Some parent hear me. (laughs) Just because they got the Holy Ghost, well, how come come little Johnny still does this? Because little Johnny has a sinful nature that he got from you. (laughs) Receiving the Holy Ghost doesn't just transform us into angels. It doesn't just take the sinful nature. We still have the choice of who are we going to serve. And that's, a, that's the beauty of God's plan. He didn't save you as an unknowing infant. He let you taste sin. He let you struggle with sin, some longer than others. He let you have that battle, and so you chose to come to him. And after you came to him, he gave you the power 
to overcome it. And they said, now the ball's in your court. Now it's up to you. What are you going to choose? You can no longer say, oh God, I just can't seem to overcome it. Yes, you can. If you say that, you, that's a lie from hell. Don't you ever say I can't overcome something. Don't you ever say, well, that's just my, that's my heritage. I'm German, so I guess that I can't, I, I have that till I die. Don't say that. You are agreeing with the devil. Don't ever say, well, I'm going to have this battle for the rest of my life. Well, no, you're not. In Jesus' name, you won't. You are cheapening the grace of God. You are taking away the power of God when you admit or you say, well, I'm going to have this struggle my whole life. Well, you don't understand the grace of God then. Because the grace of God says, no. The grace of God says, I will give you the power to overcome. I will give you the power to make it through this trial. Don't, don't cheapen the grace of God. Don't listen to that. And certainly, as Brother Tony said, don't say it. Thank you. I just, just preach. I don't want him to just keep going. He's, he was on to something. I, just, I hope you heard that. I hope you received that. Don't agree. There's power in your words. And when you agree, when you speak that out, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, stop. Everybody say stop, Pastor. <laughs> Tony did a great job. And if Tony wants to continue that thought sometime, please do. But it was a good word for us. And when we admit those things, when we say those things, we're, we're trashing the grace of God. Living for God is about making daily choices. Who are you going to obey? You've tasted sin. You still have the old nature. You have the capability to sin. Now what are you going to do? Don't complain. Don't say you can't because you can by the grace of God. Are you going to get up and pray? Or are you just going to get in your day and let whatever happens, happens? Are you going to open up the word of God? Or are you just going to... Click on Facebook and read about all the gloom and doom that's going on in the world. And then wonder why you're depressed. And then wonder why you're struggling. When all that you're feeding into yourself is junk. When all that you're feeding into is this, this is going, this is going, and all this is terrible. How do you expect to live a life when that's what you're feeding on? No, this is how you grow. It's a choice. Oh, well, I, I, I can't understand it. No, you know what? The first time I read the Bible... I think I got like nothing, very little. I shouldn't say nothing. I got very little out. It's not easy sometimes. It's not easy to, to, to get down and pray when, when God doesn't answer and when there's so many other things going on. But it's a choice we make. What do we feed ourselves with? What are we yielding ourselves to? Don't ever say it's too hard to live for God. Don't ever say it's too hard to live for God. It's too hard for you to live for God. But by the grace of God, and by the grace of God, do you think he made a mistake when he saved you? Do you think he saved you too early, saved you too late? Put you in the wrong church? Don't cheapen the grace of God. Whoever says it's too hard to live for God doesn't have an accurate understanding of the grace of God. Or two, you have, an, you have an issue obeying. You have an issue obeying. If, if you are struggling, if you are struggling with strongholds, if you are struggling with thoughts, and I'm not just talking about having them, we all have them, but there's some people that are still bound. There are some people that still can't break free. I will submit to you, it's either you, you don't have an understanding of the grace of God, or you're having trouble obeying. I've never seen someone completely submitted to God that has struggled with a stronghold. Not long term. I've seen people that have been prideful. I've seen people that obeyed in 90%, but just had that 10% that, you know, that's mine. Like, I gave God this much, but I, I'm still holding on to this. That, what you're holding on to, will take you down. That 10%, 5%, that 1%, that little bit that you just want to hang on to. But I gave God all of this. Well, you're still, 
You're still hanging on to 1%. You're still hanging on to that little thing. And it's pulling you down. That little thing. It's a, those little foxes that spoil the vines. It's those little things. So we got to say, God, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Have an understanding. Have a revelation of that. And then say, God, what is it? Lord, are there things that I am not completely submitted to? Are there things, God, that I am still holding on to? Well, I come to church and I do this and I do that. And Are you spending time with God? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you talking to him? I don't want to have God say, I didn't know you. How do you know him? You know him by talking to him. You can't know someone without talking to him. You have to pray. I don't hear from God. Are you reading your word? Are you reading your word? Don't expect God to talk to you if you're not reading your word. If you're not grounded in the word, anybody can talk, any demon, any spirit can speak to you. Why? Because you don't know the difference. But if you know the word, you're going to say, "Uh uh-uh, that's not God. I tell people, you know what? The devil sounds a lot like God. And some people look at me weird. Oh, you know what? It's a spirit. It's a voice. You, I, I talked to a kid. You, you think the devil is just some, some, some ugly creature that just, you know, is just ruthless and evil? And No, he's an angel of light. He, 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 he's a copycat. That's what he is. Everything he's done, he always copies God. So he can sound a lot like God. That's why we got to be grounded in the word. We got to be grounded in prayer. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin. Free from sin. Free from sin. There is no sin. No sin. Look, I've battled things for months, and I've battled things for years. <laughs> And I'm still battling things. But I will not say, well, I just can't get over that. I'm saying, Lord God, one day there's going to be a breakthrough. And you know what? When I look back on those long battles, I can say, all right, I see what you've done. I've wanted that instantaneous freedom. I wanted those chains just to be busted and, and just to walk out of the prison free. But God, you've let me struggle with some things. But thank you for what you've done. Thank you. You've... God's humbled me through many things. (laughs) Amen. Anyone ever ever been delivered? Anyone ever been healed instantaneously? Just raise your hand. Just just, just, uh, just say, yeah. Yeah, there there was a time when God did this or when God did that. And now, has anyone ever struggled? Has anyone ever prayed and prayed? Yeah. God has a purpose in both things. He can. He can. He can. He can. I don't doubt that one bit. He can. But does he always? No. And when he doesn't, there's a purpose. It isn't because you didn't pray enough. It isn't because you didn't fast enough. Sometimes God just has a purpose in the pain. Sometimes God just has a purpose in the struggle. But we, that doesn't mean that we're slave to it. It, The Bible says we are made free from sin. We become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men. I wonder if the praise team could come back. I would love if you could sing that second song. My gra- your grace is enough. I would love that. I speak after the manner of men because of the iniquity of your flesh. As ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. You've done it before. Amen. We've all been there. Even now, even so now, yield your members' servants to righteousness unto Holiness. That's what God wants. If you think that holiness is just, well, that's just for somebody else. uh, No. No, if you are saved, if you are saved, we are to be servants of God to righteousness unto holiness. I'm not saying you compare yourself to somebody else or look like them or do this. Look, every one of us 
is on a journey, the highway of holiness. Every one of us should be on that journey. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? You look back and like, man, my life was a mess. I, I served sin and I reaped the fruit of it. For the things, for the end of those things is death, but now, I wonder if you could stand and turn to your neighbor and say, but now, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, to have your fruit unto holiness. Please, let me just somehow just drive this last point home. I don't mean to talk like that. But let me just somehow convey this last point. We are to have fruit unto holiness. That doesn't mean that you try to look holy, try to act holy, try to be holy. That means you serve God. That means you, you follow after God. That means you yield to God. And there will be fruit of holiness. If you've known me for any amount of time, you know I hate fake stuff. <laughs> I hate, I shouldn't say hate, I just don't like fake plants. I don't like fake flowers. I like the real stuff. I think it's a shame when somebody puts a fake flower, you're like, oh, it's so nice, and you grab it, like, oh, so disappointed. <laughs> don't be offended, that's just me. Because you can't, you cannot create holiness. Holiness is a fruit that comes from a, a life that is lived towards God. It's going to happen. You don't have to chase it. You don't have to make it. You don't have to fabricate it. You don't have to create it. It's a fruit. And it'll happen. And the end of that, Praise God, will be everlasting life. Amen. That's why we're doing this, amen. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said it at the beginning. Let me say it again. God doesn't want us leaving here the same. Maybe it's just a, maybe it's just a, I, I hope at a minimum it's a greater understanding of the grace of God. At a minimum, I hope everybody can at least receive that. I hope you can walk out of here and say, I have, I have a greater revelation of the grace of God. But I believe, I believe that the Holy Ghost shook some people. I believe that the Holy Ghost shook somebody that said, you know what? I have been, I have been living a defeated life. I have been saying that I, I couldn't do this and, and I know now that the grace of God is enough to help me overcome. I don't want anyone to leave here the same. I, I want us to take some time. And whatever God has placed on your heart, maybe it was right away at the beginning when Brother Ross came up here. Maybe it was sometime during this message. But I want us to have an opportunity to respond, to call out to God, to speak to Him and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Help me to walk out of here in your grace. Help me to walk out in victory. Help me to yield my life to you. This altar is open. Your pew is open for a place of prayer. Could we speak to the Lord? Hallelujah.